if we focus upon the provincial as well as the local administration we find that there were <coughs> several divisions which vary in their size for instance in the inscriptions we find references to vishaya rashtra nadu and each are different in their uh, size in their uh, scope and uh, it shows that obviously there was a hierarchy among the provincial divisions <coughs> now when we focus upon uh, vishaya it was ruled by it was uh, administered by vishaya pati in the uh, case of uh, rashtra or uh, nadu also there were for instance in the case of nadu it was there are references to nattar who were administering this smaller uh, smaller administrative division where from this provincial division comes possibly when the kingdom is growing through aggrandizement the vanquished rulers of a particular locality they were not altogether thrown away but they were incorporated within the expanding aggrandizing larger political unit in the um, chalukyan inscriptions we find references to bana vishaya now obviously it was the lineage domain of the banas who had a long history and for a considerable period their uh, lineage domain was annexed by the chalukyan king they were not altogether thrown away the local administration remained in their hands if they paid occasional tribute as well as supplied with the required forces as and when required as and when there was a military engagement in the pallava country particularly in the uh, northern part of the pallava country we find that there were a uh, different type of administrative division there were kottam then there were nadus and finally at the uh, lower level at the village level it was the ur now kottam it had a long history pre pallavan history in south particularly in that region around say the northern part of present tamil nadu there the provincial uh, administrative uh, division was known as kottam traditionally the number has been given as 24 but if we go through we if we glean informations from the inscriptions we find the number is a bit more around 27 like the pulal kottam manavir kottam there were several kottams in which the whole kingdom was divided then there were nadus nadus they are larger than they may be a kind of conglomeration of several villages and in a particular inscription from nandivarman second pallava malla we find that uh, in kasakudi plate it is said that the, the order is addressed to a nattar kanga after the reception of the order actually he takes the follow up action and removes the older inhabitants older uh, land holders and then clears the land and uh, makes it ready for donation to a brahmin doni so this was the role of the nadu and the nattar and at the village level we find uh, things like 
ur or grama which also was a distinct uh, administrative division and there were ayuktas and other functionaries who were looking after the administration of the uh, um, at the village level At the village level, we find that, at least in uh, in the Pallava country, we find that there are also different types, different types of village assemblies were there. In the Brahmadeyas, the villages which has been donated to a single Brahmin or a group of Brahmins which was known as the Brahmadeya, they were ruled by, they were administered by an assembly which was known as Sabha and there were several inscriptions. For instance, the famous Uttaramerur inscription, then Ukkal uh, inscription. It shows that from the 8th century onwards, the sabhas had a very well organized administrative setup with different committees which were known as the variam and these variams these committees looked after different activities of the village assembly for instance from uh, the <coughs> inscription dated on the 9th regnal year of Danti Varman. Danti Varman rules from 796 onwards, so it comes to around 803-4. Uh, this uh, Danti Varman's inscription shows that there was a committee known as the Samvatsara Varyam, the committee which will look after the um, activities for the whole year. And likewise, there were several other variums and gunners who were looking after and they becomes very active from the days of Nandi Varman second Pallava Malla, at least inscriptionally, we can say they became very active from Nandi Varman's time, Nandi Varman second's time. And uh, these variums, they were looking after different activities. Those villages which has not been granted to a Brahmin or Brahmin Donis, they were the assembly was known as Ur and though it is not very explicitly stated, it seems that these Ur or assembly Ur was uh, the participation was from the whole of the village uh, population at least who has reached a considerable age. Then we have Nagaram. Nagaram means a kind of mercantile establishment and <clears throat> with these three the Pallava village administration was at least substantially well administered. In the case of the Chalukyan kingdom, we find references to Gavundas. Gavundas were possibly the village headmen who were, who were the go-between the um, central administration and the local administration. From Chalukyan inscription, we find references to several Gavundas, particularly one Jayasena, who donates for building building of a uh, uh, Jain uh, establishment, Jain uh, religious establishment. And uh, there were other functionaries also working at the village level.
if we then shift to the army establishment because already at the very beginning we have seen that the period that we are discussing was full of incessant struggle between the warring families warring dynasties chalukyans pallavas and the pandyans we find references to the army organization as well according to the tradition the indian army was divided into four corps uh, the chaturanga valam but the chariot became fell into disuse during the period that we are discussing chariot was no more functionally very important other than the ceremonial purpose at least in the warfare in the battlefield it was no more so very important uh, important as a fighting arm a fighting arm but the elephants played a very significant role in the warfare as demonstrated by the inscriptions as well as substantiated from the pictorial depictions which we find in the temple friezes for instance in vaikuntha perumal temple we find innumerable pictorial uh, pictorial representation of the elephant being used in warfare and gaja shastra that is the signs of the elephants becomes very important and some of the pallava kings are stated to be proficient in the signs of elephants understanding their mood and looking after their well being some of the pallava kings were very proficient in that apart from the uh, elephant corps then there were the cavalry as well as the infantry which also played a very significant role and uh, other than the inscriptional references for instance in kurram plates kurram plate is very important very uh, significant because it gives a very picturesque uh, description of a battlefield of parameshwara varman the second and then we find uh, references to the army organization who fought and with what kind of implements they were fighting so inscriptions also give us a very important uh, idea about what was going there was another arm the navy though not very clear from the inscriptional as well as the literary evidences but it is stated that um, some of the pallava kings they made successful um, invasion they uh, led successful invasion to sri lanka which could not have been possible other than having a strong navy though the picture is not very clear but it seems that navy also comprised a very significant part of the uh, army establishment because in the chinese sources there are references to one pallava king having a kind of deputation that he will be sending a navy which will help which will try to defeat the people on the western asia uh, a very ambitious uh, kind of uh, uh, a boastful uh, thing but at least it is say, stated from the chinese uh, informations and there are some instances when it seems that there was a very lively uh, connection with the southeast asian countries between pallavas and the southeast asian countries and if the chalukyans had successfully captured revati dwip that is the present goa it could not have been possible without having a naval arm
very few direct reference of these taxes can be found from the inscriptions but there are ample evidences through oblique references how is it most of the inscriptions in its nature in their nature they are donative inscriptions the state or some uh, locality uh, notable they are donating they are granting uh, lands or any other types of gifts to a religious functionary it may be to the brahmins the brahmadeya or it may be to a particular temple which is known as devadanam or devabhogam or it is directed to the uh, buddhist as well as jain monastic orders which is generally noted by the tamil uh, term pallichandam now all these things when they are being granted they have a portion which states the kind of taxes they are exempted from which is known as the parihara so from the list of the parihara we can have an idea what kind of taxes the king the state was generally accustomed to of taking from the locality <coughs> for instance though the incidence though the actual quantum the um, actual proportion of the land tax is not given but we find the uh, reference of irai irai means land tax it is generally stated iraili which means exempted from paying land tax actually it was not exemption generally it was that earlier what the people had to pay to the state exchequer they are now being directed to they are now to be paid to the new doni it may be the brahmin establishment brahmadeya or it may be directed to the temple or the religious institution for which the grant has been done from there we can gather names of several types of taxes for instance there is a particular name a lona gula chobham that means which is free from the disturbances of salt a curious name but it has a kind of particular reference because earlier making of salt was a kind of royal monopoly and the king or the state used to give this right of manufacturing salt to individuals for payment of a kind of royalty it is stated as uppu ko seigai uppu salt ko the king and seigai manufacture earlier what was the prerogative of the king to manufacture now it is being granted to an individual or taxes were being taken which is now being directed to the new uh, doni apart from this we have a particular name uh, for instance aparam bali vadam in those days people of a particular village they had the responsibility of supplying good quality buffaloes to the touring royal officials the royal officials while on tour they were to be supplied with good quality buffaloes or instead the village people they had to pay a kind of tax 
it is said that nallavum nallarudu that is good quality buffaloes to be supplied now or uh, you have to pay in cash or kind this in some instances they are being exempted so it was a royal tax which sometimes was exempted from the religious doni <coughs> then we have uh, for instance idai putchi idai putchi is a kind of tax which was imposed on the cattle breeders ilampuchi which was uh, imposed on the toddy tappers the king had the prerogative of getting taxes from these sectors there is another very curious instance of brahma rakshak kanam that is the brahmin had to pay a tax for his protection but simenakshi says that possibly this was taken from the brahmins as a kind of professional tax that they got the the money or the things that they got in kind for performance of religious duties a portion is to be kept aside for payment to the king so it is brahma rakshak kanam then there was another kind of tax kalyana kanam kalyana kanam is a tax which was sort of marriage tax in later days in the uh, pre modern period in the uh, late medieval period the local rulers janmis they had to be paid a kind of tax by the villagers when they went for a marriage a uh, ceremony to be conducted then <clears throat> we have kuavan kanam which was imposed on the potters tattar pattam tattar means hammering tattar pattam was a kind of tax imposed on the goldsmiths which we find in the later period in the chola period very much prevalent then we have visak kanam visak kanam viavan and kanam viavan the headman and performing his duty viavan headman was uh, or he could claim for some kind of uh, performance duty which was shifted to the state or it was given to the headman then we have taragu taragu is the brokerage to be paid then navilai navilai is a kind of tax on the manufacturers of ghee the clarified butter who uh, processed this thing they had to give a tax to the state very important thing which has to be directly paid to the state that is echuru as well as choru mattu echuru if we divide it it comes as l that is 24 hours of a day and choru that is the boiled rice whenever the state officials came for a kind of tour on official duty the it was the responsibility of the villagers to come forward by <coughs> offering them food and it was meant as a tax same thing choru mattu choru the boiled rice and mattu that is the responsibility of giving the rice to the touring officials so all these things shows that there was many kinds of taxes and generally it is a generic title that ashtadosh parihar that is exemption from payment of 18 taxes the number 18 is very significant but if we glean through the inscriptions we find that the names of different taxes they are much more than 18 so maybe it is a generic title used for any kind of tax exemption or 
exemption from payment of different types of taxes it was there in the inscriptions similarly in the chalukyan inscriptions we find it is sarva adan bishuddha <coughs> exempted from any type of adan that is uh, um, any type of uh, payment of taxes to the state the doni as i stated earlier the land was not totally exempted but the taxes which the earlier residents had to pay to the state exchequer they are now generally being diverted to the new uh, i won't say ruler but the new religious doni for whom for which the uh, religious grant has been meant for with these things we find that between 600 to 900 in many of the things in the making of the village administration making of the variums functioning uh, hesitant step has been taken towards perfection which was later perfected uh, exemplarily in the chola period but the process has already been started and the functioning of the state in its different layers that was also set afoot during this period from 600 to 900 AD 